We're going to start with um, our motivation using 37 practices of a bodhisattva. And um, for today, we're going to do um, all of the verses that we've done so far. So verses 1 to 11, just in a, an abbreviated way. And uh, you can just listen if you like. Uh, you can read along in English or read along in Hebrew, whatever your preference is. Um, but this is a, a good point in the... Um, I guess in our process of looking at the 37 practices to do just a brief review so we don't miss um, or lose what's come before. So just take a minute to think in order to understand, connect and develop bodhicitta, I'm going to reflect on the 37 practices. Verse one, having gained this rare ship of freedom and fortune, hear, think, and meditate unwaveringly night and day in order to free yourself and others from the ocean of cyclic existence. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So we reflect on freedom or leisure and opportunity, the fact that we have time, we have resources, we have ability. Time, resources, and ability are impermanent and are rare. His Holiness says that we should think, I have obtained the leisure and beneficial circumstances of a human birth, and I have met the Dharma and a spiritual friend. But despite this, I have not done the things I should have done, and I have done the things I shouldn't have done which will cause suffering for myself and others. I have acted like a man who yet falls off a cliff, though seeing it, or like someone deliberately eating poison. From today onward, I will never commit such actions, even at the cost of my life. The compassionate and skillful Buddha said that our negativities can be purified if we confess and make proper commitment in reliance in the four opponent powers. So just sit with that for a second. We have time, we have ability, we have support. It's incredibly precious and very impermanent and very rare. So we conclude May we make this life meaningful. That's the conclusion. And verse two says, attached to your loved ones, you're stirred up like water. Hating your enemies, you burn like fire. In the darkness of confusion, you forget what to adopt and discard. Give up your homeland. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. What is our homeland? What are we native to? We reside in anger, in attachment, and in ignorance. This is where we live. We need to give up this homeland. And not only that, we need to give up coming into contact with the things that stir us like water and burn us like fire. We need to give up coming into contact with those things we know agitate the mind. The identities and fixations that leave the door open to delusion. Verse three says, by avoiding bad objects, disturbing emotions gradually decrease. Without distraction, virtuous activities naturally increase. With clarity of mind, conviction in the teachings arises. Cultivate seclusion. This is the practice of bodhisattvas.
There is an outer retreat and an inner retreat. What does it mean to cultivate the type of seclusion that will help our disturbing emotions subside? Verse four says, loved ones who have long kept company will part. Wealth created with difficulty will be left behind. Consciousness, the guest, will leave the guest house of a body. Let go of this life. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. Thinking about impermanence, allowing that to free up our priorities to relax our tension about the miscellaneous stresses of this day. Everything changes. Verse five says, when you keep their company, your three poisons increase. Your activities of hearing, thinking, and meditation decline, and they make you lose your love and compassion. Give up bad friends. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. What are the bad friends in our life? Whether actual people or particular habits or different things we come into contact with, that actually escalate our three negative states of mind, anger, attachment, and ignorance. When you rely on them, your faults come to an end and your good qualities grow like the waxing moon. Cherish spiritual teachers even more than your own body. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. What are those spiritual friends, either physical people or external supports that nourish your inner development? Verse seven, bound himself in the jail of cyclic existence, what worldly God can give you protection. Therefore, when you seek refuge, take refuge in the three jewels which will not betray you. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So just considering what is my own personal, individual relationship with refuge. What is that refuge? And then we move into the section of illuminating the path, the main teachings, the path of beings of lesser capacity, verse eight. The subduer said that all the unbearable suffering of bad rebirths is the fruit of wrongdoing. Therefore, even at the cost of your life, never do wrong. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. Connecting with the idea of karma, Suffering that I experience comes from negative actions. Happiness I experience comes from positive actions.
and on the path of beings of medium capacity. We think that like dew on the tip of a blade of grass, pleasures of the three worlds last only a while and then vanish. Aspire to the never changing supreme state of liberation. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. Thinking there is nothing reliable or consistent in our samsaric happiness. It's okay to enjoy it. It's okay to want it. But thinking that stability is possible, that permanent peace is possible within the samsaric mind is simply unreasonable. And so just connect with renunciation, the determination to be free in whichever way you can frame it to yourself that resonates. And then the path for beings of superior capacity or great capacity, aspirational bodhicitta, when your mothers who've loved you since time without beginning are suffering, what use is your own happiness? Therefore, to free limitless living beings, develop the altruistic intention. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. And so thinking this is why I would like bodhicitta. And then how to develop bodhicitta, the bodhicitta of application or engagement All suffering comes from the wish for your own happiness. Perfect Buddhas are born from the thought to help others. Therefore, exchange your own happiness for the suffering of others. This is the practice of Bodhisattvas. So this is moving from the wish to go to actually going from the aspiration of bodhicitta to the engagement of bodhicitta. And in doing that, we decide to equalize and exchange self-cherishing for cherishing others. and relax your attention. So in your um, commentary on the 37 practices of a bodhisattva, um, this one, Um, After verse 11, there is a a little summary of all of the verses that came before, just a nice little pithy summary before it goes into verse um, 12. So um, all the um, uh, official students have this book, I think, by now. Um, But if you don't, it's available on Lama Yeshi Wisdom Archive. You just type in 37 practices of a Bodhisattva Dalai Lama and it'll show up on Lama Yeshi Wisdom Archive. Um, So basically you're looking for the section after verse 11 has got a little summary. So um, that would be a a recommended reading. Um, Do you have thoughts or questions about 1 through 11 um, of the verses, one that particularly strikes you as profound or particularly troubling or um, anything about the verses that we've looked at so far? Okay, so um, we're going to finish up joyous effort. So if you want to turn to the outline on page 18.
And um, if you can make a, a little note that for um, your Wednesday meditation, um, if you can make your own reflection on joyous effort based on pages 25 and 26, um, which is Ken McLeod's commentary on um, the 37 practices, verse 28, which is the joyous effort verse. So pages um, 25 and 26 for your meditation on Wednesday. Um, to see if you can do your own reflection using this as the fuel. And, um, and I'll send you an audio recording of um, a joyous effort meditation if it's just like too much of a struggle to self create. Um, you can have one that if it's just too much, you can just listen to that. But, um, but if you'd like to have a go at um, kind of making your own structured analysis that's self-led, I would use this on page 25 and 26. It's really accessible. And um, he has some good points in there that are, um, I think, useful. Okay, so back to page um, 18, the outline. We've done um, types of joyous effort. And we've done obstacles to joyous effort, and now we're um, doing supports for joyous effort. So basically what to adopt, what to abandon, and now we're into supports. Um, and uh, it says connecting with contentment, uh, supports for joyous effort, the four forces. So, um, so these four are quite, um, I think they're quite, you know, worldly wisdom as well as Dharma wisdom in a way that it marries up very nicely. They're very practical, common sense kind of ideas. Um, before we go into that, did you guys want to um, do any last minute kind of clarification or discussion about the types of laziness um, that we did last week? Ideas about, um, about that or questions about that? I think I think uh, um, about the connection between laziness and uh, what we uh, call identifications, and uh, the way uh, we tend to identify ourselves with with limitations. Do you mean um, in psychoanalysis, or do you mean just in worldly wisdom? Tell both. Me about both. It. Both. both. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you describe it as a obstacle to energy in a similar way or tell me more? Um, yeah, with, with those uh, moments or, or um, times where, we, we, where I might feel something like uh, uh, I can't or it's not me or, or um, yeah, basically I, I think more this, this uh, phrase of it's not me. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, how you, thinking that frees up the energy, theoretically? Um, well, this is, this is the practice. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's more um, delicate. <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, this particular section in, in the joyous effort section, I think is really, um, it's, it's profound and important, and then also kind of not enough also, like there needs to be more um, supporting teachings to feed into it, otherwise it can sound too simple, because it, it's, it's a delicate thing about what blocks our energy, what sucks our energy, and then what unblocks it and what kind of revives it. It, you know, it's, it's a very nuanced and subtle kind of personal experience about that. And, um, you know, this section has, has many layers, um, but on the surface, it can sound like it's maybe too simple or um, it's, not, it's not a big enough conversation. Um, so, you know, I wonder if you can kind of take each of these points as uh, an invitation, you know? It's like, okay, looking at procrastination is an invitation to see is this one way where I block my own energy? Looking at the laziness of attachment, is this an, can I use that idea as an invitation to explore ways I kind of stifle my own energy? And in particular, the laziness of despondency, is this a way I give myself a false permission to rest in a way that's not healthy as opposed to resting in a way that is healthy? Um, is it a, a way of kind of backing off from a path because of a real noticing of um, 
you know, burnout is coming, but then it goes too far and slips into I can't, and then, then it's hard to pick yourself up again. So if you can look at each of these three points as kind of an invitation for self-examination, and then see if you can bring in other teachings from the Dharma, from self-psychology, etc., and see, you know, I think the idea of what gives and takes energy is a really essential piece of the path. Because without joyous effort, um, it's going to take a lot longer. <laughs> Transformation is going to take a lot longer, and it won't be as fun, right? So it's it's uh, it's really worth sitting with. What do I say to myself that is maybe not effective, um, not as a punishment, but just if I notice it, then I'll stop. If I never notice it, I'm going to keep doing it forever. You know. Um, yeah. So anyway, if you can continue to, to look at and sit with these. Um, then the, you know, the supports are what you would think. The, the thing about these supports, the power of aspiration, steadfastness, joy, and relinquishment, is that they are sequential, right? So they do go in order of um, developing one precedes developing the next, um, and they go in this way. And, you know, they also go in order of, in a way, profundity, um, which is interesting because the last one is rest and you would think that that's the simplest easiest teaching because we rest all the time but it's it's the teaching on how to rest and why and the way to rest that will actually give you your energy back as opposed to be depleting so how and why and where to rest is actually a very um, profound conversation. Um, it just doesn't seem like it because, you know, we've been having a nap for our whole life, you know, so it's, uh, it doesn't seem like it's profound, but it actually can be really profound. Um, but so we'll start at the top and, you know, interrupt me if you've got um, uh, things to add or things to ask. Um, the first one is the power of aspiration, which is remembering the benefits of the spiritual path and positive work. So the power of aspiration is a yearning, right? That acts as a basis for joyous effort um, and sort of a drive to eliminate negative states of mind and develop positive states of mind. And what you're doing is you're allowing aspiration to build energy, just like the power of aspiration when we go into concentration. You know, aspiration is a word that comes up all over the place. But giving yourself to live permission to live in aspiration means that when you actually set out to start to do something, it's going to have a lot more energy. So it's different than inspiration. Okay, aspiration and inspiration are different things. And often we begin because we're inspired, but we actually haven't sat with that inspired, I really like to do this feeling long enough to turn into something a little bit more tangible, which is aspiration, right? Inspiration is kind of like, that sounds great, let's do it. And you just take off, right? Whereas aspiration is, that sounds great, I'd like to do it. What would that look like? What would I need to do first? You know, how does this relate to me and my current abilities? Um, what would change in my life? It's got a little bit more logic to it and a little bit more personal consideration of where would that actually fit in my life. Inspiration is just like, yeah, let's do it. And it's not as um, well thought out, but it's got more of a charge or a kick to it. And it can get you started. But if you start to do something on the wave of being inspired without kind of letting that, that inspiration settle into aspiration, what will happen is you'll start full speed ahead and then you'll get tired and then you'll stop. So what we really want to look at here is that when we actually start out on something, the, the immature side of us, the less mature kind of childlike side of us can be very delighted to start something new. It can be very delighted to go into a new part of the spiritual path. And we don't wanna stifle that delight, right? We don't wanna um, take that away or diminish it, but we also don't want to act from that place only. Because that is when we get you know, a big crescendo of activity, all sorts of things start to happen and manifest, and then it doesn't have enough infrastructure and it crashes. Right? It doesn't have enough infrastructure. So, you know, this can happen a lot where um, 
people get excited about the idea of something and haven't really considered all of the um, all of the different ways it's going to impact their life or how they will respond to all the different things. And then there's a great deal more work to be done and a lot more um, fuel needed and it kind of runs out of gas. So, so aspiration is a more mature way to start from. Yeah, and it's, it's letting yourself wait. Yeah, it takes maturity to be inspired and then wait. Let, to let yourself be inspired and let that trickle into a, I really would like to, whatever it is, and to really let that build its own um, healthy kind of hunger so that you start, you know, planning and organizing your life in a way that um, it's going to be a sustainable project once you start. So this turns into the power of steadfastness, which it says right in the Lamrim Chenmo, you have enough maturity to not start something until you're sure you can finish it. Yeah, so you don't begin a project until you know you can see it through to its end. Not because it's a good person or a bad person thing to do, but because it steals your energy if you start and then give up. It's deflating, right? If you start a project, you're all excited, then you get disillusioned and you stop halfway through, then you feel crap about yourself and you don't wanna do anything like that again. Right? So it's not saying um, you're a bad person if you stop in the middle. It's saying it's less functional and it's less mature. So it's like you've decided, I want to do this, and so I'm going to wait so I can do it properly. Does that make sense? And so this leads to a power of steadfastness, which is the conversation in Buddhism about what is the difference between confidence and pride. Yeah, this is the area where we really discuss the difference between healthy confidence and uh, dysfunctional pride. And they can look like the same thing from the outside. Um, you know, someone who is proud as opposed to someone who is confident. It's hard to know right away which place they're operating from, but you want to ask yourself where you're operating from. So the power of steadfastness is also called like firmness or positive pride or confidence and it's never turning back from working for the welfare of others because you're thinking about their needs as well as your current ability and potential. And, you know, this steadfastness really means that you have tried things and they've been effective and that gives you kind of a confidence that if you continue along the same trajectory, it's gonna work out well. So the first type of this positive pride, positive pride of action, is um, where you say to yourself, this work, whatever it is, of course, in this context, this work of becoming enlightened, is so worthwhile, I'm going to do it even if no one else supports me or does it with me or thinks it's a good idea, by myself alone, I will do this. Yeah, by myself alone, I will do this. And you hear Lama Zopa Rinpoche often finish a teaching with this quote from the Lama Rinpoche, where he'll say, I dedicate all of the energy of this teaching and that teaching to the full enlightenment of all sentient beings, which I will accomplish by myself alone. Which is crazy, right? Because we know that we don't do anything alone. Yeah, that everything requires supports and influence and experiences and things like this. The point is the mentality. So if you have the mentality of this is important enough, important enough that I will do it even if no one supports me, you will have the energy to do it. If you set out to do the thing with the assumption of, look, if I get enough support for it, then I can, it's not going to work out in the same way. So the example I like is, um, for example, if you've just found a new beautiful place to go for a hike, and you've been there and you think it's beautiful and now you've tell, told all your friends and you've said there's this beautiful waterfall at the end of this this hike let's all go on friday and you're really excited right because there's this beautiful waterfall that you want everyone to see and it takes a certain amount of effort to get there if you think to yourself i'm going they can come or not they can come or not, but I'm going because this waterfall is so beautiful and it's so enriching to see it. I'm going to go and I'm going to invite all my friends to come with me, but it doesn't matter if they show up or not. I'm going. 
with that attitude, probably a lot of people will come with you. Yeah, and they might even bring snacks, right? They might bring a blanket. You might make a whole day of it. It might be beautiful and enriching and you have a whole community party. If you think from the beginning, I'm only gonna go see this waterfall if all my friends come with me, then you put all this pressure on them that will probably make them not feel like going. Yeah, and there you are at the car all by yourself with no friends going with you on this hike because you've sort of put all this needy energy and all this attached energy and all this expectations and all this pressure. And also you've made it about, I don't know, something different than the point. You've made it about prove to me that you care about me so that we can go do this good thing. You know, it becomes kind of immature, right? So it's completely human to be in this kind of motivation of I'll only do it if I get support. But it's actually a lot more functional if you think I will do it whether I get support or not because I care about it enough to see it through. That opens up the energy to have the very support that will help you. So this whole idea of, um, it's called pride in action, this idea of I will do this practice of becoming enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings by myself alone, doesn't mean that you have to do it by yourself alone. It's the mentality. Yeah. So, so what do you think about this one? I mean, does it make sense though? To continue with, maybe uh, I'm asking if the confidence, not only if others come with, with, with you or not, uh, the confidence of the um, truth or right of the way without depending on the results. Okay. Because there are times there, there will be no, no results. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and it, it can also be that the immediate result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. I, and I, yeah, I, no me. I'm thinking about the journey of human spirit program that Ranan holds it for so many years and many years people thought it's crazy and it's something that can't be done but he still believed in it you <laughs> he still believed in it and you pursued this uh, path until it happened and it's I think it's this kind of uh, confidence yeah and and all of you deciding to take it on you know you could you could have had your whatever psychoanalytic accreditation by now right if you'd done another program or would nearly have it done but it's it's that there's a um a value you see in a process that's longer and deeper that's worthwhile for its own sake if it was all about a, you know a piece of paper or a you know certification process or something um, you know you could have done it by now but you knew that there was an importance in a deeper path and a longer path with more to enrich the process because at the other end of it you're going to have a skill set that's going to be of more benefit to others and you know it's it's kind of this idea of it's it's a good enough reason even if no one else understands the reason it's an important enough path even if no one else is on this path so it's like a, it's a confidence in yourself but it's a confidence in your own ability to read what is important in life do you know what i mean so it's it's both like a i'm confident in my ability to do it but even more than that is a, i'm confident in my ability to recognize wisdom i'm confident in my ability to recognize a good path and so I can have some faith that I found a good path and that gives energy that type of confidence so you know if you're surrounded by people that don't get it um, you're not looking down on them you're just feeling really fortunate that you've had the supports in your life to make you aware that there's more you can do and that you know um, life is not just about the material or the immediate 
And, and that, that can be a very satisfying self-knowledge um, that can give you a lot of energy and a lot of fortitude. So, you know, by myself alone is a fascinating headspace because it is, it's completely counterintuitive. It's like, um, I don't want to do it by myself. I can't do it by myself. How should I think about doing it by myself? But as soon as you've decided I can do it by myself, you wind up with all sorts of help. Yeah. But if you go into it of, I need all sorts of help, all the help will run away. Yeah. That's what happens. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a delicate balance, but even if you don't get the help that you want, you're having enough of an enriching experience of, even if I don't accomplish the goal anytime soon, even if the goal is still kind of unclear to me, this whole process is healthy enough and joyful enough that I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm gonna do it anyway. You know, it's a bit like um, how a lot of us view karma and future lives of, Probably it's the case, but we don't really know. But living as if it's the case means that we're a very ethical person. And that is a good thing. You know what I mean? So it's like the goal is a good reason, but even just the process itself is uh, valid enough to keep us going, even if the edges of the goal shift or the clarity of the goal shifts, still the process is useful enough to keep us going. Yeah, and it leads to the kind of behaviors that we value. So, so this is one level of this power of steadfastness. The other is called like pride in ability. And this is the most um, easy to slip into afflicted pride or to slip into arrogance because this pride of ability says, there are a lot of people out there who can't do what I do, which is a dangerous place to identify, right? It's a very dangerous place because easily you could think, cause I'm amazing, you know, or whatever. Um, but what you're really saying is, I've had really fortunate conditions. I've had fortunate experiences and I've had important teachers. And that means I can do certain things that other people can't do. Therefore, I should do them. Yeah. And, you know, this is really true of all of us. If we had a more disastrous life, if we had a more traumatic life, if we had a busier life, if we had a poorer life, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we would still have our Buddha nature, we would still have our ability to change and transform, but it wouldn't have led to the particular skill set that we have right now currently. So it's a pride in what you've been able to develop, but it's, um, it's without over-identification or grasping at inherent existence, because you know every one of your tools is only valuable in a certain context, and every one of your tools was born from infinite conditions. So it doesn't make sense to get proud about it or get cocky or arrogant about it because it's not like you own any of it anyway. And it's not like it's useful in every context anyway. And yet, and yet it is worth celebrating and valuing and letting yourself be nourished by. You know, the fact that you're good communicators, the fact that you're empathic, compassionate people, the fact that you're well educated and think deeply about things don't need to be identity points, but they can still be points of positive confidence or pride that gives you energy. What I can do, not everyone can do. Not forever, not ultimately, but right now, what I can do, not all can do. It's right in the long run, and it is a delicate place that would be easy to misunderstand, but it can give you some strength. Do you know what I mean? This one? And you see the dangers right away, right? It would be easy to go to the wrong way of thinking with this, but um, can you see the right way of thinking about this giving you some energy? What if you were to just list to yourself all of your skills? Right? It would be a, so embarrassing and cringy and we wouldn't want to do it and we would feel like we were being struck down by lightning or that God would punish us or something depending on our background. But what if you were to just sit with all of the things and the skills that you have? You know, it, it, if you just let yourself sit with them, I think that you could become filled with joy that you have so much to offer. Yeah, who you are in your family, who you are to your friends, who you are to your neighborhood. You know, let yourself be with the fact that, that you're a little bright light in this universe and it sounds cheesy and, you know, horrible and American to name it that way. And yet it's still true. And it can be fortifying. 
Yeah, unless you go the wrong way and let it uh, open up the door to all your deficiencies. And sure, I can do that, but I could do so much more. Sure, I could do that, but others do it better. It could open the door to a whole other trip if you let it. But um, I, I think it's useful to sit with what are you able to offer this world right now? Because it can really give you some strength and also give you a kick in the bum a little bit of, therefore, I better use these skills, actually, and not be lazy about them because otherwise I'm wasting all of these opportunities I have, you know? If I have all these resources, I better share them. Do you know what I mean? You know, you could be alone at your house and you're, there's your dog or there's your cat and you could think, they are not studying today. They are not meditating today and they are not seeing any clients today. They are just sleeping on their cushion. Yeah, like <laughs> right now, I'm the one in the house getting the job done. I better get the job done. <laughs> right? And you pat the dog and you say, darling, next life, maybe next life, you know, but what, what you can do, they can't do right now, you know, it gives you some strength. <laughs> sure, it can be quite a useful way to think as well. But, you know, the point here is like, what's going to give you a joyful, energetic practice that will have momentum and continuity. Yeah. And if you think you're surrounded by Buddhas who are cheering you on in different forms, that can be very useful too. And your cat's like, come on, feed me, you need merit. You know, it can be quite useful. Um, but it can also be useful to think, no, it really is just a cat with just a cat rebirth, not studying at all, all day, really thinking, how shall I sleep? How shall I eat? What shall I kill? Can I have sex with something? It's not a great life, right? It's not a super virtuous life. Maybe they have like an occasional moment of maybe I'll comfort someone, maybe I'll look after my young, but those are like incidental moments in amongst a lot of non-virtue. Yeah, if we live exactly the same as our cat, despite having human abilities, it would be a waste, right? It would be a little bit of a waste and um, a bit embarrassing, right? <laughs> right, if we have all these skills and abilities, but then we still lived exactly like our cat, it would be sad, right? This is the discussion of courage in Buddhism. And it's still under this category of the power of steadfastness. So this is, um, it's called uh, pride over afflictions. And basically you're saying, I am stronger than my afflictions if I remember, <laughs> right? If I'm awake, if I'm mindful, I can be bigger and stronger than my stupid anger. I can be bigger and stronger than my stupid attachment. Yeah, I can, I will, I shall, right? It's, so this is the conversation on courage, but it's basically reminding yourself that if it was important enough, you wouldn't let yourself get afflicted. If it was important enough to you to not be afflicted, you wouldn't be afflicted. Have you ever made yourself bigger than the situation, right? Have you made yourself bigger than the situation? There's chaos happening all around you and you decided what's happening right now is too important for me to lose my compassion. It's too important for me to become self-centered and make it about me. This is too important. And so you held your mindfulness imbued with compassion and you didn't slip into your BS, right? Have you ever done this in your life? I'm sure you have. I'm sure you do it during the day all the time, right? especially, you know, with your family home all day, there's probably times when you want to shout at them and do, and there are probably times that you want to shout at them and don't. Yeah, you decided that my own personal reaction to this situation is not as important as the harmony of the family, so I'm going to keep it together for all of our sake. Sometimes you can, right? And then sometimes you get tired and distracted and you forget and you shout at them you know, I'm guessing, but this particular pride is reminding yourself that you already have this ability to be bigger than the drama. You already do. Now it's about choosing it and re-choosing it more often. So that becomes the trend of your life. So that becomes your way of being. So it's, it's a, it is, it's a type of confidence born from memory and born from self-awareness. Even if you haven't done it that much in your life, you've done it and it shows you you can. Yeah, you can be bigger than the drama. You're bigger than your patient's drama all the time. You don't listen to their drama and think, 
and say to them, I'm sorry, that's really boring. Could you talk about something more interesting in your life right now? I'm getting bored. Right? You don't make it about you, right? You're professionals, right? You don't think, wow, that trauma is a little too graphic for me. Can you just turn down the details? I don't want to hear about all of that. You don't say that. You're bigger than the drama. You haven't made it about you. Um, you know, so you're just sort of taking, okay, professionally, usually doing pretty good. In the family, mm, we'll see, some days good. But just reminding yourself you have this ability gives you a confidence. Um, so that's the third kind of positive pride. So we have uh, pride of action, pride of ability, and pride of afflictions are the technical terms for them, but it's basically um, developing this deep inner confidence, um, which gives you energy. And it also means you don't have to prove anything because you've already sort of connected internally. Did Rana? Repeat the, the categories. The pride of action, the pride of ability, and the pride of affliction. They um, all go under the power of steadfastness. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, this one is, is, is really interesting, I think. Um, I think it's really interesting because pride is fragile, afflicted pride. Confidence is not fragile, right? Confidence doesn't have anything to prove. People can think that you're stupid and you don't agree with them and you don't get defensive and you don't have to tell them differently. You just go, huh, you think I'm stupid. Huh. Oh, well, yeah. Whereas if your pride is engaged and someone thinks you're stupid, you immediately need to show them that you're smart or immediately need to prove that they're stupid or you get into a whole afflicted mess, right? But confidence doesn't really have anything to prove. It's very relaxed, right? And because it doesn't have anything to prove and it's relaxed, it's not costing you energy, it's giving you energy. Afflicted pride takes a great deal of energy to maintain. There's all this assessment of how people are seeing you. There's all this assessment of who you think you should be. You know, there's just all of this pressure that you put on yourself with pride. And it's exhausting, yeah? But confidence is not exhausting. And, you know, it's again, it's placing your identity on your potential as opposed to placing your identity on kind of like a worldly tick list of, you know, who you think you should be in order to be valued by society. Instead of that, you're thinking, I am good in nature. So far, so good. Slowly, slowly. Relax. Yeah. You see this with His Holiness, right? Like His Holiness is very humble, but it's not like he's meek. Yeah, and you know, the, um, I use this example a lot, but I love it when he talks to neuroscientists and quantum physicists and, and they tell him some profound new idea from science that's something that Buddhism proved thousands of years ago. He doesn't tell them that. He doesn't say, yeah, that's not a breakthrough. We, you know, Nagarjuna explained that perfectly in the blah, blah, blah century. He doesn't do that. He's got nothing to prove. When they tell him these things, he just says, wonderful. Yeah, wonderful, right? He doesn't have to say to these neuroscientists, actually, you've got a little bit more work to do. What you've, your breakthrough is good, but you need to go a few steps further. He doesn't say that. Um, the quantum physicist talking about how everything is empty of inherent existence. He doesn't say, yeah, tell me something, I don't know. He doesn't do that, right? Because he doesn't have pride, but he's completely confident. He doesn't say, oh, you're very brilliant. I'm just a stupid old monk. He doesn't do that nonsense either, right? So, so I mean, if we can think about people like this who have this very steady, happy confidence, they are not defensive. They're not arrogant. It's a whole different vibe. And it requires a lot less maintenance, right? <laughs> it doesn't cost as much. Yeah, pride is the thief of joy and it's the thief of energy. And it's a huge thing that we need to look at in our society because of how much ambition is valued. Yeah, how much money, possessions, status, ambition are valued, it, you know, it makes pride seem like a necessary component of life or something that we need to cultivate. And it is, it's a devil in our life. Pride steals your joy, steals your energy. Yeah, it's much more relaxing to have nothing to prove. Yeah. Okay, questions about uh, power of steadfastness or um, additions?
Power of Joy. Um, this is uh, being insatiable about the spiritual path. You know this word insatiable, right? Um, like it's, uh, it's never enough, but not in a bad way. It's like it's never enough because it's so great. Yeah, and so they, they equate this to um, kids at play. So in the beginning, middle and end, um, kids at play, you know, they're running around, they're expending a great deal of energy, they're working hard, but they don't think of it as work, right? When kids are running around playing, like, you know, think of like a bunch of seven-year-olds playing tag, like we would never run around for that long, right? We would just be like, wow. <sighs> but they run around and they're happy the whole time that there is effort expended. And the reason they stop is they like need a snack or a nap or to go to the bathroom and then they go right back to playing, right? And this is the kind of attitude that we want to bring to the spiritual path of we have to stop sometimes because we have to eat and we have to go to the toilet and we have to have a sleep, but we love it. So we just do those things and then quickly get back to it because we love it, not because we should or anything heavy like that, but because it's a delight. So, um, so the power of steadfastness leads to the power of joy. There's, there's a direct relationship between the two. And then when you have the power of joy stable, then you know how to rest. Then you know how and when to rest. So the power of relinquishment is um, preventing burnout and illness, noticing when you're tired and deciding to rest before you burn out so that you can continue positive actions later once you've rested. Um, there's, there's this quote in um, Lamrim Chenmo, I think it's from Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life or Nagajuna, I'd have to look it up. But it just says, when you're tired, rest. <laughs> you know, like from the eighth century, like as if we needed to be told, if you're tired, rest. But the idea is that it's a support for joy and you need to rest before you're exhausted and depleted. Because if you only rest once you're exhausted and depleted, the recovery time is a lot longer, the momentum has been killed, and it's a lot harder to pick up where you left off. So it's much more skillful to, to rest regularly than to push, 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 and then completely crash and have a total, you know, breakdown and need to, you know, take a month off and then crawl yourself back up to where you were. Um, so the power of relinquishment is knowing that at our level physically and at our level mentally, we need breaks so that we keep the joy. Yeah, we need breaks. And when we take breaks, they need to actually be breaks. So we don't wanna shift from one type of stimulation to another type of stimulation because that won't let us rest. Not because it's bad, right? So whatever you choose as your way of resting, you have to check, is it actually rejuvenating? Or is it just stimulating me in a way that my attachment likes and giving me a break from whatever just happened before, but it's actually giving me one more thing to process? Yeah, this can happen where, um, you know, whatever you've just read before bed, say it's not Dharma, say it's a novel or something, you can still be thinking about it the next morning. You know, it's like the, the novel has like, infiltrated your sleep and now you're processing the whole plot of the novel the whole night through and you had one more thing to digest. So it doesn't mean you can never read a book, of course, read what you want, but um, make sure that we're like accurately naming things so that we give our chance, give ourselves a chance to recover. Do you know what I mean? So this is about not filling in every space. It means if there's space in your day, if you have an unexpected 10 minutes, you don't have to be in a frenzy to fill it up with, I should read something, I should check something, I should talk to someone. You could just sit quietly and recover. Like have a glass of water and look out the window. You know, it, it actually means that you're in a better position to continue the momentum of the day. So um, it, it's hard discipline to allow breaks to be breaks because once we get really upregulated, once we get really stimulated, the transition point is very uncomfortable. From being, you know, working really hard, being very stimulated, thinking about many things, having kind of a degree of mental activity, and then having a break, 
even if we need a break, it's hard for us to allow the level of stimulation to go down. Yeah, that transition point, like the first five minutes, you feel like you need to fill in the space. Like, oh, I've got a break now, but I should read something, I should look at something, I should do something, something, something. And, and we keep that level of agitation because our nervous system has been activated that way. So if you remember that it's just the transition point is a little uncomfortable, but it's very short lived. You know, if you give yourself five minutes of being a little bit uncomfortable in the transition point, then there's a great relief and the recovery and rejuvenation. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's just a, a step back from our rest techniques and just checking if they're actually serving the function that we need them to serve. So it's very encouraged to rest, very encouraged. Just, just make sure that what you're doing to rest is actually restful. Does that make sense? And that is a huge support for joy. Hopefully it's reassuring that it's right there in black and white. Please rest when you're tired, <laughs> right? And if you want to be doing the good, wonderful work that we all do, um, it's not indulgent to rest. It's actually vital. And that we don't have to listen to all of society's silly things about you're only allowed to have a break if you've fallen apart. That's completely unhealthy and neurotic, and we don't want to model that to our friends and our family and our coworkers and our clients, right? We don't want to model that. We want to be someone who's a different example that says, Actually, busyness is not a virtue. Yeah, we have to not glorify being busy. Yeah, we need to get our pride out of the idea of being busy. Ants are very busy, right? Bees are very busy. Doesn't mean they're on a spiritual path. Busyness is not a virtue in and of itself. You know, and so it's, it's a radical rebellious act to say, today, I'm not doing nothing. You know, it's really confronting. And if people ask you what you're doing today and you don't have a whole plan laid out, <gasps> oh, shock horror, right? It is, it's about letting go. It's about having the, yeah, exactly the right pace. And that, um, you know, you have to be very present to know what is your actual energy level as opposed to what you assume your energy level is based on yesterday and the day before and the day before. You know, because some days you could work for 12 hours and not be exhausted. And some days you work for two hours and are devastated. You know, it's so to have enough self-awareness to check, to know today what is, what is the pace that is sustainable yeah. So just um, for Wednesday, remember to have a look at page 25 and 26 and, um, and we'll leave it here. Okay, so just take a minute and recenter yourself for the rest of the day. Okay, thanks guys.